Carol, when you go out in the garden, does the light seem different to you? Yes. The sun is in a different position in the sky. It is less intense. It is. And we're just glad in the Southern Plains that it is great. We're grateful that it's not trying to kill us anymore. Although it's still working on it because it's hot today. It's going to be 99. It's not going to be cool here, but it's not going to be 99. I will say that September skies are some of the bluest skies Mm -hmm. we have all year. They are. It's beautiful. All right. I'm going to get us started on this episode because we could wax poetic about September skies. But welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana, where I have a suburban garden measured in square feet. It's about a third of an acre. And I'm Dean Ash from Guthrie, Oklahoma, where I garden on several acres out in the country. We call ourselves Garden Angelists because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening and we want others to love it too. Yes, we do. And we aren't afraid to spill the beans and tell all of our gardening secrets, the good, the bad, and even the ugly. But that's enough of who, what, when, where. Let's move on to this week's episode. How does your garden grow, Carol? Dee, my garden grows dry. Here too. So we went, we were really dry in May. And then in June, we started to get rain. July, August, we're in pretty good shape. And I Mm -hmm. went out there the other day and I thought, this grass is crispy. So I've I've turned the irrigation system back on to water the lawn. So that'll kind of perk it up because you really don't want to go into winter dry because we went into winter dry last year and you can really tell it in the in the spring. So I'm kind of watching, hoping for some good soaking rains. Otherwise, I might water some things I've never watered before. But anyway. Okay. People in Oklahoma are now laughing and people in Texas. The idea of not watering is just never comes into our minds because we have to water the whole gardening season except for when we have torrential rains in the spring. But from the time it becomes real summer, we water. And I even water a little bit in the winter if it's above 40 degrees, just to keep everybody happy. We're under a fire danger this this today, another fire danger deal, because the winds are really high. The good news is, in my neighborhood, everything burned down, so I don't have to worry too much. There's not anything to burn. Well, I, I talked to a friend of ours in Virginia. Uh, Mm -hmm. Marion Wilburn and they're really dry and she lives in a wooded area and she says for the first time she's thinking about fire danger and where where would she go and how would she get out so this dryness is no joke it clearly is no joke but it is no joke but it is what it is and there is rain in our forecast I'm sure if it is in my forecast it's in yours eventually it will be in mine towards the end of the week I think I haven't looked in a while but out in the vegetable garden Yes, I picked picked cherry tomatoes, lots of green beans. Um, I tore out the squash and cucumber plants because they were done. And I'm not going to lie that a couple of squash bugs might have ended up in the trash. And the trash goes to an incinerator. It's a good place for them. So I also picked the first two figs. Um, I probably should have waited a day or two. They were not as quite as juicy as they could be. And then I managed to get some sunflower seed heads before more whoever's tearing them off and eating the whole thing. So those are drying in the garage and I'll I'll get the seeds off of those here soon. And so kind of that's it. What about you? Well, I'm doing lots of weeding in the mornings because while I lounged inside on those hottest days, the weeds took over and that mulberry weed is going to seed and I don't want it to go to seed because... I'll never eradicate it from my garden. It's everywhere, but I don't want more of it. I got a story about mulberry weed. You do. On oh. on Wednesday, I went to Newfields, which is the art museum and, and gardens. And I was talking to one of the horticulturalists, and he was weeding in this huge, huge, huge mass of yews that they have by a window or whatever. And when you looked under the yew, it was completely carpeted with mulberry weed. And That's he disturbing. says, you know, it's it's hard to get it out from under there. And he said, you know, we'll never be completely free of it. But we both agreed that this weed showed up, what, five years ago? I mean, about this, that. Yeah. And it is it is everywhere. But yeah, anyway. it comes from China. We did it. We did it a, a piece on it 
on the podcast when we did a piece on weeds. Right now, mul- mulberry weed, which I absolutely hate because it's hard because there's a lot of seeds. It snaps off if you don't get right down at the soil level. It is very sticky when it's young. So it's very hard to get out young. I'm telling you, it's a bad weed. I'm So I'm weeding and I'm also having, um, I've got some nuts edge, but not a lot because I watch it closely. I've got honey vine, which is a native weed, but it will cover your whole world. And I'm trying to be careful because I'm kind of watching out for the bumblebee nest because I don't, I don't want to disturb them if they're still there, but they might be gone. It depends on what type of bumblebee they were. So let's see what else did I do. I it is really hot this week, but I'm still going out in the mornings and weeding at least at least thirty minutes, usually in an hour. And then I finished spreading compost in the vegetable garden. Garden, remember I told you I was going to do that. I did it right, and I sowed some seeds for some fall crops. And what I did was watermelon, reddish, Easter egg mix, radishes, turnips one kind of lettuce just to see if it would even come up. And it did spinach. That's a little early, but I did it anyway. Carrots in the cold frame. And I also planted more bush beans and they're up and growing like crazy. Everything is because, and that, you know, that made me think again, well, we're going to talk about that in the vegetable deal. So that's a tease. And then I also did a few Instagram videos. I ordered a few more zinnia seeds. Don't laugh. And I don't know where I'm going to put all those zinnias, but I've really been inspired by all the breeding that is going on, all the selection and breeding. And there's just some cool new things. And you know, those seeds I planted about a month and a half ago. I do. From the flower farmers down in Texas, Honey Acre Farms. Um, they're up and they're blooming. So I'll take a picture of those for the cool. new newsletter. They're a beautiful shade that you don't expect to see in zinnias. So it looks really good in the kitchen border. That's all I did this week. I did more than I thought. Yes. As one does. So favorites, what's your favorite? Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. My favorite is the little zinnia and gustifolia. And I wrote a post about it yesterday. I just called it little zinnia, but that baby just pumps out the blooms, very little fuss. It's what they call self-cleaning. So it just keeps blooming. Nice little mound. Um, I sowed them from seed cause you can't find them and I'm definitely going to get more next year. Did definitely. you say it was Xenia and Gustafolia? Yes. And did, yes. Okay. And so those are the little ones. And did you have a mix that you bought or? No, they, um, it's the crystal series and it comes in crystal white, series. yellow and orange. And I brought up, bought them from true leaf market where you can buy literally 10 of the yellow 10 of the white. So they have really small quantities. That's nice for people who have small gardens, you know? Yes. And then for my favorite, it is all those little fall vegetable seedlings. They are all up and growing and I just got to keep them alive during this week. Cause I think next week will be better. And they, they seem really happy in all that compost. I mean, like really happy. And that did a lot for my heart. That would be, yes, that's good. I should sow some little seedlings. It's too late here to sow any green beans. I don't know if they would even get to the flowering stage, but you could. it's not too late to do little seedlings. Like lettuce and stuff. For like lettuce, that. I think, yeah. I might. We'll see. Do that quote. I'm going to do the quote. Then the flowers became very wild because it was early September and they had nothing to lose. Grace Paley. I looked up Grace you Paley. Did. She's an American. American short story author, poet, teacher, and political activist, born 1922, died 2007, wrote three critically acclaimed collection of short stories, which were compiled into the Pulitzer Prize and National Book Award finalists, The Collected Stories of 1994. That's that's all I know. Super about impressive. It. It's hard to do that. So Yeah, she had her parents were Russian, Ukrainian, Jewish, and she was born in the Bronx. So um Anyway, quite interesting. And we saw this because you actually saw it. And it's a lady that we follow on Instagram. And she does these beautiful floral pictures. Do you have her name? Katie. 
Daisy. Katie That's Daisy. It, Katie Daisy. Daisy Katie. Yeah, I think her handle yeah. is Daisy Katie or something like that. But you could people should go look. We'll link to her Instagram. We'll put on her Instagram so people can see. And she has a lovely Etsy store and already have a mug and a t-shirt. And you wanted to buy the print of this quote and and I talked myself out of it, but uh, then I went and bought something else. So I don't know that it did any good. I buy too much stuff. Speaking of buying too much stuff, uh, <laughs> flower topic. <laughs> <laughs> I have a big garden, Carol, a big garden. You do have a, you do have a big garden. <laughs> My husband came to me, Bill came to me the other day and he goes, we spend too much money. And I said, look at this garden out here. I said, it's a very expensive garden. We really need to move somewhere with less land that is less expensive. And he just, he just put his hand out like, never mind and walked away. <laughs> so our flower topic, sometimes he's thinking of retirement, but sadly he probably won't get to. Yeah. Our, our flower topic is ordering bulbs isn't the same as planting bulbs. And so we wanted to talk about our tips for ordering bulbs and then we're going to, it's easy. <laughs> oh yeah. Clickety, clickety, <laughs> click. Uh, but let's let's take this in a rational manner. Then we'll talk irrationally. Okay. So okay. the first tip I wrote down was you need to order them soon. These these companies will sell out quickly, especially new vi- varieties. I mean, some of them, if they put out a post of a beautiful looking tulip and it goes viral, it's gone. It's, gone. it's going to be sold out mm-hmm. because th- they've, they, get their shipments in from mostly the Netherlands. And so once they've got that crate full and it's shipped over here, there's no going back and saying, could you get me another thousand of these? They're not going to get, nope. they're, they're limited. Right. So your first piece of tip is order soon. Yes. <laughs> Second one is make a plan for where you will plant the bulbs so that when they arrive, you're ready. So in my case last year, I decided to do all those white bulbs in my center, yes. the white daffodils in my center island, which got burned, but they'll come back. They'll be all right. Um, daffodils, it's really hard to kill daffodils. Anyway, I made a plan before to intersperse those white daffodils around my uh, double flowering caria japonica. I can't believe I even remembered all that. My Japanese caria. So I did that and I was ready. So there's that one. Number three. Three. Go with some tried and true along with the experimenting with the new to you bulbs because tried and true means you know it'll do well, it'll come up, you'll have flowers. You experiment with new stuff, which you may or may not like, but you might be surprised. So it's kind of like be in a rut, but not in a rut. Which would I, I would say that's your gardening philosophy, period. Be in a rut, but not in a rut. I mean, no, go with tried and true, but experience with a little bit of new to you stuff, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then um, I'm more the type that I go, ooh, let me try that new tulip. But I'll say this, tulips, you know, just don't let your heart be swept away by tulips too much because voles, everybody loves tulips. Deer love them, voles love them, et cetera. I just wrote an article on bulbs that deer and voles won't eat so well the other thing i say let let's talk about tulips that in some lot of tulips will not come back reliably the second year so i would say most treat them as annuals and pull them up when you're done and in fact my my nephew's wife they're going to pull out some shrubs in front she's not going to replant till spring and i'm going to suggest in this it's not a big area that she put like a little river of tulips in there not expensive ones, Mm -hmm. just put a little river of tulips where those shrubs were. They'll pop up in the spring. She'll enjoy them, rip them out, put the new shrubs in. She'll more than enjoy them. She'll fall in love. You know what you're doing. Okay. Number four, larger quantities often cost less per bulb. And you can buy from a couple of different companies, um, Van England, and we, we can... Well, people can just look them up. It's not England. It's England. We'll, we'll put a link. And that, we'll, you want to put a link to So them? John okay. Sheepers is a bulb company everybody's familiar with. That's the retail. Yeah. You can flop arm. right over to Van England. And then instead of 10 bulbs for $10, oh, it might yeah. be a hundred hundred bulbs for 50. So it's like, it's the wholesale price. 
Right. And usually their quantities start at 50 on most bulbs and then up. So I know 50 tulips sounds like it's a lot or 50 daffodils, but it's really not. Yeah. It's, or 500 I mean, crocuses. Not really that many. Yeah. Because Carol grows a lot of crocuses. I don't because voles and stuff eat them. Yes. Okay. So um, five. There you go. I was Ready? I was at the hardware store and they had bulbs for sale in packages. Do not be tempted to buy the bulbs now. It is way too soon to plant them. They aren't always the top size that are in the retail stores, sad to say. And in my case, I usually target around Halloween to plant bulbs. And I think you target Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I usually do it around Thanksgiving or between th Thanksgiving and Christmas. But that's a really busy time. I will. I usually do it once we get good and cold. That's when I do it because you have plenty. We have plenty of winter usually. But, you know, here's the thing about bulbs. It's all usually. I mean, you just don't know what kind of winter you're going to have anymore. And just don't get your feelings hurt if things don't go as expected the first time. Now, I like your exceptions, and I want you to talk about those, and then I'll talk about how those don't work well in Oklahoma. Okay, so before I get to the exceptions, I will say that oh. if you go to the store and it's late uh, October, early November, and they got bulbs marked down to practically nothing, I I have been known to get some of those practically nothing bulbs and throw them in the ground. It's not much money, Me very too. little effort, and, you know, good stuff will come up. So the things that should be planted as soon as you get the bulb, and that would be colchicums and autumn crocuses. These are things they will send up shoots in the spring, and they flower then in the fall. And I'm going to start watching mm -hmm. for colchicums and crocuses in the next week or two. And then snowdrops, if you get snowdrops, they don't like to be out of the soil very long. So they should be planted right away mm -hmm. in Indiana. How about in Oklahoma? I thought of something. Well, and I thought of two more things. So uh, lilies, lilies aren't technically a bulb, but they're sold as a bulb. Um, and they need to be planted as soon as you get them in the mail. And you're not going to really find a lot of lilies locally in Oklahoma. You might at the big box store, but my advice is always order your bulbs because unless they're just on sale and you're walking by and you think you'll take that, because here's the thing, you'll get them and they're really supposed to be planted. And they'll and they will have been held in storage someplace that isn't hot. So there's that. So lily bulbs need to be planted now. I I think the same with Lycoris, you know, the naked ladies yes. and the um, other one, the Lycoris radiata and Lycoris guamajera. I think those both need to be planted now too because they need a little warmth. And so I would plant those. And here's the thing: I don't know about the Lycoris, but the autumn crocus and the colchicums. If you get them now and you mm -hmm. plant them now, you'll actually get bloom this year. And then they'll come up with just foliage in the spring and then they'll bloom again in the fall. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Okay. So here in Oklahoma, I have experimented with colchicums. I've never experimented with autumn crocuses. I can't tell you how they grow here. I have not ever been able to get a colchicum to come back. Now, snowdrops. Absolutely, they are impossible to grow here, in my opinion. Um, you might get two blooms from them if you stick them under a water spigot and they're happy. And, you know, actually snowdrops like to be replanted when they're in the green. Yes. So it's even more complicated. But my answer for snowdrops is to grow leucogum. Leucogum is summer snowflake. Leucogum, it's not Estevum, I don't think, but it's Gravitate, it's Gravitate Giant. Anyway, that plant will not only grow well here, it will multiply and you will have a sea of white leucogem. They don't look anything like snowdrops because they're taller, but snowdrops are tiny. And you just need to go look at those beautiful pictures from England if you live in Oklahoma. Yes. And I will say this about the leucogem. Oh, my God. Those things, they take off here and they can... I have pulled so many out. Take over. I've pulled them out and pulled them out and pulled them out. And it's like, you back? Mm -hmm. The other thing I was going to say, yeah. the autumn crocus, because, you know, in, in the spring, I have thousands of crocuses blooming in front and in back. And especially in front, people are like, you know, you, you got a lot of crocuses, Carol, because it's just a sea of them now. So I, Wonderful. I intersperse some autumn crocus so they think that I'll have magical powers to make those bloom in the spring. Fall. You wrote a blog post about that the other day, and I laughed. I, I wrote that. I, like, I, I think on. I write that annually. Look at my magical powers. So do people want to know what I bought for spring planting? 
Well, your list is longer than mine. So yes, let's hear what you bought and some rationale to help other enable other people. So I went to Old House Gardens because I really love their little daffodils. And they are really good about telling you which daffodils grow in your zone. Because there are northern daffodils and so- southern daffodils, right? Yes. And I'm right in the middle. So it's a little complicated. So you can put in your zone and they tell you what grows here. So I am really into white daffodils and I'm going to put more white daffodils out where I put the other ones. Okay. The ones that burned in the berm, the center of my driveway. Because I have that whole theory. I actually went back and read all my bold posts for my article I wrote this week for Oklahoma Living. And even though I ordered these ahead of time, it actually fits in with my philosophy, which is plant things that you really want to see close so you can enjoy them. It's how to love your garden more. So I bought WP Milner. It's a pale yellow that fades to white. Dawn, which is white with a yellow cup. Stop a minute. Stop a minute. I got to look up this WP Milner. Okay. Can I go on while you look it up? Well, no. Well, I've got my question answered. Okay. What's my, your question? My third grade teacher was Miss Wanda Milner. And I thought, I wonder if this was named after my third grade teacher. It was not. No. It's from 1869. Man, probably. Okay. So Jenny Daffodil, which is a small white with a long cup. And then Papillon Blanc Daffodil, which is white, hence the name Blanc. And then I bought, while I was on there, I bought oxblood lilies because I don't have any. And I was like, why don't I have oxblood lilies? That seems odd to me because they grow really well here. And then and then I realized why. Because they're really expensive. Three bulbs was high, believe it or not. But they do multiply. That's, that's the same with like chorus, the surprise yeah, lilies. Yeah, like chorus are high too. Good they're grief. very expensive. And I look at mine and I'm thinking, gosh, I mean, I've dug and divided and spread them all over. And I know I've got a neighbor around the way and they've got massive clumps of them. And I says, you could dig and divide these. But yeah, we divide, I divide mine quite often. Now they fuss, those like chorus really fuss when you move them. It takes them about a year or two to get their groove back, but it doesn't matter. Okay. And then um, I bought a couple of tulips from them. So I bought black parrot and I bought Rococo and both of those are late blooming and doubles because they are going to go with my other bulbs from Eden Brothers. And I'm going to coat all of my bulbs in plant skid this year the tulips, not the daffodils, because that stops the voles. And then um, I don't have a dog, you know, my dog passed away. So I don't have to worry about him digging up the plant skid stuff. Then from Eden Brothers, I bought Hawaiian Sunset Mix tulips and Merlot. It says Merlot Mel, but I don't think that's quite right. I think I lost something when I copied it over. Um, Anyway, it's a mix and I'll have the right name in the pot in the deal because I'm going to write it this week, but that's what I bought. You know, and I, I did go out there to Eden brothers and they've got some beautiful, beautiful, oh my beautiful gosh, those tulips. tulips. I can see why you bought some. Now the way my garden is set up and everything, I thought, I just don't have a spot for those that would do them justice. And I'm, I'm really honing in on March the 31st, which is Easter. And it'll be very early. And so I was thinking, what's going to be blooming on March the 31st? And I thought, ah, those tulips won't be blooming. I mean, they'll be nice. No. And I'm going to plant all of the tulips out in the kitchen border, which is where I plant my tulips now, because that is right by where we record the podcast. And I can just look outside and see them. And that makes me happy. So, And also, that soil is extremely easy to dig. I don't even need to use my drill for it. I just, my drill attachment my auger. I'm going to plant. Oh, and I'm going to plant one of the, so I think the Hawaiian sunset are going to be planted in this bed under a tree where I sometimes plant tulips. And I went and weeded all of that last week. So I, I actually have a plan. I know, which for me is amazing. So I'm going to plant tulips around my mailbox, but once they've bloomed, I'm pulling them out because it, that's not a big space and I don't have room to stick annuals in there with them. And that's what I did mm-hmm. this spring is I planted some in there and they came up, they bloomed, and then I pulled them out. And so for that, the local greenhouse, she'll have some bulbs. I'll just I'll just buy a small bag from her 
So I actually haven't placed an order because the Kionidoxa and the crocuses in the lawn, they've been coming up good. Now, I do see a little vole activity out there, but I'm telling oh, no. you, there are so many out there. There is no way they could eat them all. No way. The voles here would just eat every bit of them because I've done it before. I used to have Tommy's Crocus Thomas, Tommy Sciences. I used to have those in my garden, in my lawn and in my front beds. And they were beautiful for about mm, a year. They ate most of them. But these have been going on for several years. Plus, guess what I have in my backyard? I don't know. There's a feral cat that hangs around. Well, that helps. Yeah. So kitty cat. The neighbor feeds her or him, and then I, I see him or her lounging in the backyard, and I'm like, if you are killing voles, you stay. But if you're not, you're out of here. I don't know how to get rid of it, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's our Oh, and I looked up the Merlot. It's Merlot Melody Mix, and we actually had a picture of it in our last uh, newsletter. So. Okay. Very good. Do that quote. Ready? Yes. A garden is a grand teacher. It teaches patience and careful watchfulness. It teaches industry and thrift. Above all, it teaches entire trust. Gertrude Jekyll. I don't know that I trust my garden. My garden will just get out of hand and cause all kinds of issues if I'm not out there making sure it does what it's supposed to do. But and I'm and that makes me sound like I'm super obsessive compulsive and I am not. No, you, know. you are not. But this uh, garden is full of plants that just want to take over. Yeah, trust is a, yeah, that's an interest. Well, I don't know what she's talking about. Well, you trust that seeds are going to sprout. Oh, well, I do trust that. Yes. And that, you know, spring will show up. Vegetables. So our topic is, what did our vegetable gardens teach us this year? Yes, and I thought this was a great topic. Did you come up with it? Well, if you think it's a great topic, I absolutely did come up with it. (laughs) I don't remember. I think I did. I think you did. And I think I said, oh, that's a great topic because I can tell you one thing that's really, really taught me this year, as if I didn't already know, soil is very important in the garden. And if it gets burned up, it messes everything up. Worst vegetable garden I've had in years in the potage because it got burned. and then. I replaced all my potting soil for the tomato pots and they were fine, but I'm not happy with the soil I put in there, the potting soil. And I'm going back to my favorite potting soil, even though it's expensive. And then I rehabbed all of my garden soil by adding a ton of compost on top. And after the fall vegetable garden is done, I'm putting a whole bunch of mulch on top of that. Very good. What else did we learn this year, Dee? Stress plants attract bugs. I had more bugs than I've ever had in my entire life. Bad bugs, bugs that are irritating. What about you? So I I learned that tomatoes actually need very good support. My little experiment with running string between two posts to support the, that didn't failed it, miserably. Didn't work, and, huh? So why didn't it work? Because I see commercial growers do it all the time, but I think I know why it didn't work. I didn't use a strong enough string. So they fell. Yeah, I can see that. And they just sort of, you know, flopped. And and I think you really have to be diligent about weaving the plants through it. And I wasn't as diligent as I should have been. I also learned for, the life. Yeah. Raccoons. Unbelievable. Oh they just gosh. kept. I just hardly got any big tomatoes because they kept eating them. I'm so. You need to hire someone to remove the raccoons. Well, you know, my neighbor next door, he's feeding them when he feeds the feral cats. So it's a happy life here for them. It's a happy life. Well, they got tomatoes to eat at my garden and they go over to his place. And anyway, I'd hire an extermination company to come in and relocate them to the woods where they should live, not at your house. Yes. That's just my thoughts for next year. Anyway, what else did you learn? I learned that if you plant green beans every few weeks, you will get green beans all the time. I have been eating green beans all summer long since, I don't know, into June. Okay, I'm so jealous because my green beans were totally eaten by bugs and had every kind of disgusting disease. And they were stunted like everything else in my garden. But that's okay. I've got some now coming up. I'm just now starting to see some Mexican bean beetles eat on them a little bit, but they've been just as clean as can be. 
so many Mexican bean beetles here. But go ahead. I also learned that all not all squash plants produce the same. So I That's planted true. a light green variety called I think it's Denari Denar Denar Denier. I don't I don't think I've got it written right. I got a ton of those. And then I planted one called Max's Gold, which is the gold color. Got a ton of those. But Black Beauty, which is an old standby, I didn't get very many off of that. I don't I don't like Black Beauty anymore. There are better um, varieties of squash out there, in my opinion. Yeah, so I, I'll probably skip Black Beauty and go with something else. But uh, And then, of course... It's Durrani, D-I-R-A-N-I. Okay. And you know why you got you know why it's so good? Because it's Middle Eastern. And those Middle Eastern squash, they're like the squash that come out of Mexico, the light green ones. They just produce a ton. I have a lot better luck with with those. But keep going. Uh the other thing that I learned well, and you've given up on squash because of the squash bugs. Mostly, yeah. Uh, they show up, but they show up later in the year and then, you know, I pulled the plants put it all in a trash bag, send it to the incinerator, and they get boned up. As soon as I have blossoms on the plant, they show up here. No, the no. The moment. Yeah, I live in Oklahoma, not Indiana. Okay, I know. what next? Uh, I learned that Blue Beauty is a fabulous slicing tomato with dark shoulders. I had not grown that before, and I that is one slicing tomato that I have gotten some from, and that's on my, ooh, grow that again list. Hardly any disease on it, because which goes to my next lesson, which is trust the seedlings. My seedlings all did great once they got growing, but it took them a while to take off. And I, you remember, I panicked a little bit, and I thought, oh my gosh, these these tomato plants aren't going to do anything. And so I got some store bought tomato starts, and then my neighbor gave me some, and those have hardly done anything. They they petered out much earlier, so I'm going to trust my seedlings next year. Good idea. And so what you're saying is you trusted them better than the store-bought plants, because I agree. They did better. They started smaller, but they they really went running past the store-bought ones. And those store-bought ones, they're just terrible. I will say that if you buy seedlings from someone like the Tomato Man's Daughter or Edward Joseph Farms, people who specifically grow them in your locale, you know what I mean, who care yes. about their crop, that's almost as good as you doing it yourself. Yes. When you buy them from the box store or wherever, those seedlings have been through a lot of um, stress before they ever even get to the parking lot. They have, so, and I suspect. And so I bought like a little six pack of them and then my neighbor gave me some he had left over. I suspect that they treat them to keep them short so that they don't get too gangly in those little six pot, six, six per thing. Oh, growth inhibitor. Yeah, I yeah. bet they do. And Which so, is not exactly what you want, but um, I, I mine always happy. are better. Yeah. I'll say that about my peppers too. Remember my shishitos and I couldn't, I forgot to start any and I couldn't find them anywhere, blah, blah, blah. Well, I bought some at a box store and they looked good, but they were terrible producers. They were just terrible. So, and that wasn't in the potager. So it's not the fault of the soil that was in the, the pots. I, I will definitely grow my shishitos from seeds again. So what was your last piece of Potatoes, learning? are they worth it? Oh, my gosh. Worst potato crop ever. Yeah, I was very envious because I watched Gardener's World and um, oh, I can't think of his name now all of a sudden. He's one of the ones we really like. Anyway, he did a big tub of them. It wasn't Monty. Adam? He did a big tub of them. It was Adam. Yeah. He turned that tub over and there were lots and lots of new potatoes. And I was like, I got like the most pitiful harvest ever. But I will say he actually tried. I didn't try too hard. Now, if I was an Instagram influencer, what I'd do, I'd go to the store and I'd buy a whole bunch of little potatoes and then I'd bury them in there. And then when I turned it over, there they'd be. Golly, you think that's what Instagram influencers do? Well, I ain't a, saying that's... nothing. <laughs> Okay. So what we both learned is that no year is going to give you the perfect crop of everything. And that's true. Yeah. No year is the same either. Exactly. So green beans, you're going to try again, of course. Both of us. Yeah. And I did. Both <laughs> of us skipped yeah. the cabbages, broccolis, and I didn't start my purple sprouting broccoli. I thought, you know what? I procrastinated enough. 
Are you going to grow it in the spring? Probably. Yeah. So I'm not anti people growing all of the coal crops that you have to start ahead. It's just um, you need to have them covered because the cabbage butterflies, they're everywhere. And if you grow stuff in the fall, it's always better. Your fall garden is better for fewer bugs because, you know, some of the bugs have have finished their life cycle and aren't laying eggs anymore, which is so appreciated. It is. Uh, Summer squash you've given up on and I'm going to give, I'm not giving up, but the squash bugs come later for me so I can get a decent harvest. Both of us would agree that tomatoes are more complicated than you think. But they're really wonderful and worth growing. And next year, I'm going to try to grow a second crop. I'm going to start seeds indoors in the summertime so that I can have a fall crop of tomatoes because I know I can do it. I just am going to do it. You can't do that here, but I'm going to try. Okay. And I suggest people should grow both determinate and indeterminates of tomatoes because you're just hedging your bets. And also grow some heirlooms and some modern hybrids because then you get the best of both worlds. What do you think? I think you are right. And so going to grow vegetables again next year, Dee? Of course I am. I'm growing them this fall. So yes, I will. And the answer for me is, of course I will too. (laughs) Why don't you do that next quote? Because we're going to talk about books. There is space on everyone's bookshelves for books you have outgrown but can't give away. They hold your youth between their pages like flowers pressed on a half-forgotten summer's day. And that's Enid Blyton, an English author of children's book, born in 1897, died in 1968. That seems a golden time for books. It does. Um, People who were born in the late 1800s and went on through the 60s. Um, So you asked, what is a book from your childhood that you can't give up? Well, how about you? Well, so I laughed and said, it's that... Rodell's Organic Gardening that I started checking out of the library when I was like so 10, 11 years old. Of course, I learned a lot of fiction too, but that book just keeps <laughs> coming back around. And so, um, but I do remember another book and I don't know the title, but it was about these kids who go to visit their grandparents for the summer. And like day one, they're exploring some, you know, back of some closet that nobody's been in for years. They discover a treasure map. And so, you know, that sets the course for the whole summer. And every beginning of summer, I think, wouldn't it be great to discover a treasure map? And I wonder what that is, because it's got elements of um, C.S. Lewis, because they discover they're in a grandparent's house and they discover a wardrobe where they walk through it's and find not a whole that. other world. It's a treasure map. No, because there's no map. There's no treasure map. I don't know that book. So, but there's an Instagram account called My Old Books. And uh, it's, yeah, a, it's Peas, Peas Porridge Press. Yes. And so you can direct message her a description of the book. And then she'll post it and ask people to comment if they happen to know what the title might be. So I thought maybe I'll put together a short description of that book and see if anybody recognizes what that might be. Oh, here's one post, and I know exactly what it is. I'm trying to find a historical novel I read during the 90s. A girl, an orphan, is going to be adopted by a couple she finds intimidating. I think they're German or Swedish, and there's a language barrier. So she goes on a quest to find a different family home, but every possibility ends up not working out. And... She accidentally swaps babies around while babysitting, I think. Lots of hijinks. So um, I've never heard of that book. and But a lot of people figured it out. What is it? Well, someone thinks that it is Bloomability by Sharon Creech. I never heard of it. And then it. there's an, another person thinks that it could be Gratefully Yours by Jane Buchanan. Never heard of that and one. Join Joan Lowry Nixon wrote the orphan train children, which I read. That's not it at all. So um, I think that's a fun account. It is a fun Um, account. And the other thing, this is, this is going to tell you where my mind was. And I'll tell you it's fifth grade. Okay. Okay. We had a science book and the, there were four pictures on the front cover and one picture was somebody in a greenhouse. And I used to look at that picture forever in a day thinking, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. Well, of course, because you're 
checking out Rodale's organic garden. So, but as a kid, I don't think anybody could <laughs> ever find a science books from the that would have been from the late 60s, like 70, 1970, 71. Would oh, that's this science book. Anyway, what was your book from your childhood? Oh, mine was there were two Black Beauty, which I read and checked out so many times. I think I wore the book out at the library and <laughs> Little Women. And I have multiple, even to this day, I have multiple copies of Little Women. Like one day, one of my friends said, Have you read Little Women? And I just went around the bookshelf and sent her pictures of every, cause I've got the penguin classics version. I mean, I've got them all. Uh -huh. And so I got the illustrated version anyway. And then because of this question, I ended up buying another copy of black beauty while I updated these notes. <laughs> I, I did want to say this. I do miss the library card in the back of the book. Because like I do too. that Rodale's Organic Gardening, I mean, my name would be like over and over and over. And wouldn't it be fun to get that for Black Beauty? Is he D, 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 over and over and over. Yeah. Deanne, Deanne, I was Deanne back then. Two words. Um, yes. And I'm just going to say it's my birthday week. So, I mean, I did buy myself a birthday present. Little Women. Yeah. No, I didn't buy Little Women. I have every copy of Little Women, including the Mr. Boddington copy. What did you buy? No, it was Black. I bought Black Beauty. Oh, you bought Black Beauty. Okay, I misunderstood. I bought the, I bought the Puffin Classics one that's cloth bound. You know, the really. Well, of course cool you ones. did. It was my birthday. None of that has anything to do with on the bookshelf. We have a new book. <laughs> it just came out this summer. It's called Why We Garden, the Art Science. It's pretty. I'm, let me finish the title. Why We Garden, The Art, Science, Philosophy, and Joy of Gardening by Claire Massett. And I asked for a review copy of this, which I got. And then you, I held it up and you said, oh, that's pretty. I want it. No, you, I got a recover. You got me one too. Oh, okay. I got a review copy. Okay, good. This is not one I bought, but it is pretty. Um, I think it does fit in with our previous topic because it's attractive, like, like a children's book. Yes. And it's got some, it's got really nice um, illustrations in it. Uh, hand hand drawn illustrations, and basically it's reflections on gardening, with a lot of references and quotes from other garden writers, past and present. And there's ten chapters, so it focuses on aspects of gardening like beauty, work, order, nature. Yes, yes, and it's it's good, and it has quotes from very famous people, and it talks about basically why gardening is important. And actually I said that I was reading it online on Instagram and I, this fits in with some, with a rabbit hole my daughter went down, which was um, that she's watching, there's something on Netflix about blue zones, which you and I've discussed on here before. Right, people where people live who to be live over. in blue zones or yeah. they're super healthy. Well, one of the things that was in there was called purposeful, purposeful exercise. Okay. So the idea is that if you get exercise outdoors that has some sort of purpose, then it's different than exercise you do in a gym. Okay. Like a treadmill. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And part of the, part of the, and, and gardening, he used gardening in that show and she has a quote in here or a section where she talked about it, where she talked about how it is purposeful exercise why would we do that you know exactly like digging and bending squatting standing up over and over and over taking again. weeds to the weed pile yeah because all of that is squats yeah lifting toting um, mm -hmm. we've made our world too easy for ourselves and so since we've made our world too easy for ourselves it makes it you know hard it makes it, it makes us not well so I can't find where that quote was again, it's somewhere in my pictures, but anyway, it was, I think that that's one of my favorite parts of it where it talked about that. Yeah. And I like all the different quotes and stuff, which you and I have Thank heard you. of almost everybody that she quoted, um, but a lot of new gardeners haven't. So this would be a great gift for somebody who is new to gardening or is fallen in love with gardening new, all over again, yeah. or just never took the time to like we do obsessively read and talk about gardening. This would be a great gift. Yes. It would make a really good gift within a basket. It yeah. really would. It's People a, did that with my book too. Yeah. 
it's a good bedside table book too to pick it up and instead of picking up your phone to scroll mindlessly through Instagram or Facebook or email, you could pick this up and just choose a chapter. The cha- You can just pick a chapter, read a chapter, and you'll find something new. Every time you read it, you'll find something new. So it's yeah. really nice. It is nice. There's a lot of work that went into it. So and that's, I, I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Why We Garden, The Art, Science, Philosophy, and Joy of Gardening by Claire Massett. There you go. Okay, are we ready to move on to dirt? You want me to do the quote? Yes, please. Often I hear people say, how do you make your plants flourish like this? What is your secret? And I answer with one word, love. That's by Celia Thaxter. And anybody who's a gardener has read her book, which is about gardening in on an island, on her, her little plot, her little windswept island. It was one of the very first books I read. Off the coast of Maine. Mm-hmm. So our dirt, dirt. I found our dirt and sent it to you. And you said, this is precious. It is precious. So you found it on Instagram, but there's a project called the Loose Ends Project. And what they do, and I'll take this right off of their website, is came about because the founders, Jennifer Simonic and Macy Kaplan, both avid knitters, realized they had a shared experience. Friends would often ask them to finish blankets, sweaters, or other projects left undone by deceased loved ones. They always do so enthusiastically, understanding what it feels like to wear something a loved one has made. So, if a loved one has died and they left behind an unfinished quilt or sweater Sweater. or afghan, you can submit the project, and they have a website, loosenprojects.org, and we'll link to that. You can submit your Mm -hmm. project, and then there are volunteers literally almost around the world now who will take the project. They'll they'll put you in touch with them. You mail them the project. That person will finish it and send it back to you. And then they put some of those touching little stories on Instagram of all kinds of things. What what happens after it's finished? Yeah. And they give it to the person. That's what made it so precious. So... This just made me remind reminded me of something. Catherine Hall, who's a garden writer out in California, um, she did projects every year for a long time for Afghani women. And it was a knitting project where you knitted a scarf to, and it was people all over the United States knitted scarves for women in um in Afghanistan, okay, up in the hills, because they had they didn't have access to certain things and also it was kind of a care project from the united states because we weren't mad at the afghani people you know right. what i mean that's how it started and so i actually knitted a scarf and sent it nice. a- along with her project nice. yeah a long time ago it was fun i don't know if she still does it but that's what this reminds me of and it's just a lovely idea well people love handmade gifts and i i here's a story of knitted scarves Years ago, Indianapolis hosted the Super Bowl. Yes, I remember. So they got, I think it was scarves, maybe it was hats. They got all these knitters to knit scarves and hats. So all that when the teams came to play, they were all presented with it like a handmade scarf from Indianapolis. It was kind of cool. That's really nice. It was kind of cool. Yeah, it is cool. Or maybe it was a hat. I can't remember. So anyway, that's our dirt is loose in projects, which is wonderful. My my sister, my older sister, she knits, crochets, quilts, weaves, blah, 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 blah. She does all this. I'm going to send this to her. She could finish up so many things. But she always gives. She could. She gives us nice handmade gifts that have like a an element. Like she, there was a pillow cover that my mom loved when she was in the nursing home. It was white and had little balls on it. It was just soft. She made little snowman angels out of that for all of us for Christmas. Wow, she is creative. Yeah, very creative. But anyway, that was our dirt. I'm going to do the next quote. I have only done one sensible thing in my life to cultivate the ground. And that is Voltaire, a French writer and activist who died in 1778. He's a very, very famous French author. I read some of his works in French. It was very hard. Okay, that was back when I thought I was going to have a minor in French. All right, rabbit holes. 
What is your, do you want me to do mine? Cause mine's really mine. Fun. Really? I went down a couple rabbit holes for this, this episode. So I I'm good. You, you do yours. Cause you did the heavy lifting. You did the heavy lifting on this episode. All right. Mine wasn't about gardening at all. Quite by chance last night, Bill and I found a movie on acorn called the lost King. And I read the description and I said, Oh my gosh, Bill, this is when they found Richard the third. And he goes, was Richard the third lost? I said, Richard the third was lost. His body was lost. And I said, Carol, and I actually put this on the podcast once, right when it first came out. And I said, they found him in a parking lot. And he goes, no way. I said, yes way. And this is the story. I'm super excited about it because this was such a great story. This is the story of Philippa Langley. She is an amateur historian, writer, and sleuth. And she actually has... um chronic fatigue syndrome, like that author author that we love that wrote Sea Biscuit and the and some other books. So she has chronic fatigue syndrome. And this was the story of her quest to find Richard the Third. And I I mean I'm given away that he was in a car park, but here's the deal. It is so much more than that. And I'm not going to tell people anymore. That's it. It's wonderful. You should watch it. She also wrote a book about her search called Finding Richard III, the official account of research by the retri- by the retrieval and reburial, reburial project. And so that's the documentary. And there's also a documentary film. But this is kind of a, it's a, a lady plazer, but it's pretty accurate because I went and researched it. That was my rabbit hole. And Ooh. The Lost King is very accurate. Carol, you got to go watch it. You will so love it. It is, it sounds it right. is life affirming. It sounds right up my alley. I'm going to go watch that. So good. Better than watching Burn. that. There's a series of YouTube videos. There's, an, I don't remember his name. There's a guy that does World War II history documentaries on YouTube. And he's got a series now about uh, Adolf Hitler and did he really die in the bunker? And oh. I'd rather read about No, go watch this. this go, this I'd rather read about Richard III. So. Trust me, it's it, it's really fun. So what is your garden commission this week? So my garden commission is it is going to be hot, not hot like Oklahoma, but hot enough. So I'm watering. I'm going to plant out the lavender that's out there. Um, If the sprinkler system up front is working, it wasn't working all summer. So I had to hand water those zinnias all summer until I stopped. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Pulled them out of their misery. Um, I might get some mums planted up at the entrance, but I'm not. I'm kind of waiting for the heat wave to subside. But that's that's about it. Not a lot planned. I think it's too soon for me to take cuttings off like my African blue basil because it's a long time till next spring to nurse those things along. So, yeah, I'd wait. I'd wait until the last minute because you do have to nurse those along. I I don't think that that's the easiest thing to propagate, really. They're easy because to root. you kind of need. Yeah, there are. But they but. keep growing and they'll grow. And so and they grow and they grow and they grow. I'm actually going to use those in the front of the kitchen garden, not the kitchen garden, the kitchen border next year in the front of it that faces toward the street because they're too big for my cutting garden. And I've got to find a place for all those zinnias I bought. So, so. what I do with what I did with the African blue basil last year, I rooted the cuttings and then, you know, like forgetting to water and stupid stuff. Some of them died, mm-hmm. but I got a new plan for that. And then when they start to get too big, I will take yep. cuttings again and root those. And use those? As the, well, that's kind of, of an, well, no, it's sort of the insurance policy ones. And so, at, at the, the you know, at the end of last winter and spring, I had three good cuttings. So I I think I'll have more than three next time because now I know what to do. So. And there's and mine were ugly. When I pulled them out of the greenhouse this year, they were just ugly, wonky looking cuttings, you know. And then with as soon as it got hot, they took off. Yeah, mine are huge. And they are beautiful now. They're huge and they look like little shrubs. So if it you know, if anybody wants to grow one. So you want to hear about mine? I do. I'm going to thin my seedlings and keep weeding and mulching. And I'm trying to figure out if those bumblebees have flown the nest because there's so many re- weeds around that nest that, you know, my friend got stung when she got too close. I warned her, but she just wanted to get that last weed Ugh. and she got stung and it hurt. She was pretty, yeah, it took a week to get over it. So it is so hot and I will just be going out in the mornings and we need rain. So everybody let's pray for rain. Yeah, let's do that. All right. That's it. 
Thank you for listening to The Garden Angelus. I hope you've hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. We publish every week on Wednesdays at 12 a.m. Eastern Time. If you listen to Apple Podcasts, we'd love a five-star review that helps us get noticed by others. Could you also share our podcast with your friends? Word of mouth is still the best way to get the word out there. And be sure and check out our show notes for links for more information about today's topics, plus links to our own websites. And subscribe to our new Substack newsletter, The Garden Angelus at Substack.com, also linked to in our show notes. If you do, you'll get a link to listen to the podcast a day early. And if you want to help support us, use those affiliate links. If you buy something after clicking through on them, we earn a small commission and it costs you nothing. Or you can set up a monthly subscription through Buzzsprout or make a one-time donation through PayPal. It was lovely to chat with all of you over the garden gate. Bye until next week. Bye, everybody.